keeping the cats safe at home because there's an awful lot of issues now with cats roaming free. There's a lot of counties here in Florida that are cracking down on, on roaming cats. And we get calls from folks all the time that want us to keep their cats in the yard. That's something that we can do. So some of the hazards that we do look for, as I said, would be, for instance, an open swimming pool that the animal could get into that we want to isolate them from. Another would be um, poisonous plants in the yard. There's an awful lot down here in Florida that um, uh, can um, be a poison problem. And the best thing to do is just check the, the plants in your yard. If you're not sure, check with um, um, the Humane Society. It has a wonderful site. They have a listing of all the, um, the poisonous plants. Some of the more common ones would be things like a sago palm, um, that and the berries from the sago palm. The dogs eat those. It's very, very bad. Um, azalea, um, anything like that that your dogs, especially your puppies, could eat. Any of the, uh, the mulch that we'll see out there, that, that new red um, rubber mulch that looks so good for so long. We get puppies ingesting that. That's a problem. So we want to keep the dogs away from that type of area. Um, other things out in the yard, obviously um, any chemicals that are in the yard, if you happen to have an outbuilding or a garage, um, you're going to want to make sure that you can keep them away from any of your fertilizers, um, any of your plant foods, potting soils, believe me, the dogs will get in there and ingest that, and that's, that's not a happy thing once, once that happens. So we'll, we'll look for areas like that within the yard. Um, we'll also look for um, uh, where you're keeping your lawn equipment, things like that, uh, gasoline, oils, any solvents like that. It's obvious things that we, we should keep the pets away from, but we tend not to think about it. We'll go into our garage, it'll be the same thing. We'll have gasoline, we'll have oil. Um, we have to be careful about antifreeze, that's pretty, pretty apparent. I think everybody knows the dangers of their pets ingesting antifreeze. Uh, there are alternatives to using the antifreeze we have in our cars right now, but most people aren't going to really don't even know what they have in the car, so they don't know if they can use an alternative. One nice thing is there are there are a number of states right now that are um, trying to get it, um, have it set up where all antifreeze sold in the state has an additive to it which will make it bitter tasting. Right now, ethylene glycol, the, the um, product in, the, in antifreeze that causes it to taste sweet and is the poisonous uh, component, um, this will make it so it doesn't taste as good, and it's an issue with, uh, with pets and children, and this is why they, they want to try and find a way to prevent this from happening. So we want to isolate all these areas. That's things that we can see outside. There's other areas that we've spotted um, that would not necessarily be poisonous, but when we're taking a survey of the yard, and it's things that we might not think about. Um, the old unstable wood pile in the back of the property, or a pile of old pavers or um, um, slate or something like that you've got on the back side of the garage. And we've seen too many injuries over the years of pets that have gone nosing around, especially a new pet, uh, puppy, new kitten on the property. They'll nose around back there, create a little bit of an avalanche, and all of a sudden somebody's at the emergency vet clinic. So it's not a bad idea from time to time to take a scan of your yard, take a walk around. If you see dangers like that that have come up, take care of it, either either by eliminating that, that uh, situation, removing the... Uh, the uh, poison or the, the um, pile of debris that's in the yard or isolating the pet from it. Um, I had mentioned swimming pools a little earlier. Swimming pools are a big problem. We get calls about this all the time. People will want their pets kept away from the pool. If you happen to have an above ground pool, you're, you need to find some way to keep the dog from climbing up on the, uh, on the platform. Once they get into the pool, they can't get back out. And that, that's, we know there's gonna be an issue there. Um, in an in-ground pool, very often they're within a pool cage, and we, we don't want the dogs in there either. But very often, that's also the way for the dog to get into the backyard. So we do have some solutions that can help people isolate the, um, the pool so the dog can still have access into the yard. Now, once we've set up a, uh, a nice safe area that the uh, pet can be in the yard, we know that all the dangers are out, we have to make it a fun place for them to be as well. And what we do stress to our clients, uh, if you've got a cat, we need to make sure that you've given them some areas with some bushes and some trees to climb. Cats like to hide, they want to get in and out. And if we have a cat loose in the yard, we highly recommend 
a some form of uh, pet door that they can get in and out of. Cats really need to have a way to get out of that environment, get inside. If there's another animal after them, um, you know, a predatory animal, they need to be able to get inside. Um, you're not going to be able to keep other animals from coming into your yard. Um, we also recommend dog doors for our uh, clients that want to have their dogs loose in the yard when they're not out there with them. We don't recommend that we leave pets out in the yard when we're not home. But if you are home and you want to have your dog have access to the yard at all times, we have some pet doors that are available. And we, we do recommend those. Um, I don't know if you're aware, there, there are five counties right now in Florida that have just passed ordinances against tying your dog out and leaving them in the backyard even if you're not there. Or I mean, even if you're at home. It's just, it's illegal. You can't do it. And it wouldn't matter if you had food and shelter for them. And they're trying to prevent the situations of the dogs being abandoned out in the backyard. I don't know why we would do that anyway, but, but people tend to. I can get a list of it for you, but it, it is um, Dade and Brevard and Broward are three of them. I'll have to get the other two for you. Um, so if you do have to have your pet out in the yard or you do would like to have your pet have access to the yard when you're not, when you're not out with them, make sure that you give, give them some shelter and some water. And there are a couple of really good companies right now. There's one called Drinkwell that will provide a, a little bubbler that you can put out in the yard so your dog or cat will have fresh water all the time. They hook right up to your faucet and they work really well. It's, it's just something that you might want to consider. Um, you can put a bowl of water out there, but it's not always the easiest thing to remember to go out there and, and fill it. And if you have a puppy, you know how often you have to fill it after he tips the bowl up and runs it across the yard. So that's... Yes. I uh, I don't really uh, have a like a, I have a problem with my dog door because I'm afraid that um, like raccoons and things mm. you know they'll come in and get the food. Well, we have the solution we have for that is one of our electronic dog doors, and the the question was that not wanting other pets or other um, other animals in this case it was raccoons coming in and eating the cat food or the dog food. Well, we do sell a an electronic dog door. And I have one at my house. I actually have two at my house. We have one for our cats to get in, and one for the the cats can go through the cat door and the dog door. The dogs can only go through the dog door. And, it, and the way it's set up is the animal would wear a little fob, key fob on their neck or one of our collars. And when they enter, come up to that door, it will only open for them. It will open, allow them in or allow them out, and then shuts behind them. Now, at my house, for instance, uh, we allow them in and out all day long, but at night we don't want them going in and out, so we just lock it. So you do have the ability to lock it whenever you don't want them going in and out. I live right in the middle of Bradenton, and at, even though I'm right in the middle of town, we have raccoons and possums coming across my backyard all the time. And I really don't want to wake up at 2 in the morning with a possum and eating the cat food. So we, we take that precaution ourselves. But somebody doesn't have to have an invisible fence in order for the, that pet door to work. They can, we just sell the, uh, the door and it has a little, as I said, a little key fob that fits on their neck. It'll fit up to five pets if somebody needs their uh, animals to have um, access to the yard when they're not around. All right. Another thing that we do when we come in is we evaluate inside the home. And there's a lot of dangers inside the home that most people are pretty much aware of. And a good thing to think of is if you've baby-proofed your home, you've pretty much pet-proofed it as well. But um, unless we have young children at home, a lot of those things we'll tend to forget. But it's things like putting, if you, especially with a puppy, put baby latches on your kitchen cabinet so that they can't get in there. You may not, your last dog may not have been inquisitive and wanted to get into the cabinets. Your new puppy may. They're all different. They're all individuals. Um, we'll want to isolate them from getting up on the kitchen countertop, keep them off of the stovetops, things like that. Um, we, obviously, medicines, it's a big problem. A good friend of mine is a veterinarian, and she's told me many times that she'll have clients bring pets in that have ingested information, um, medications that they shouldn't. And one thing that they really seem to like to get is sink their teeth into any kind of a, a tube with any kind of ointment or salve in it. And maybe it's just the feeling that they have in their teeth, but they'll chew those up, and that's never something that we want the pets to to eat. So you have to keep all that away from from the animals. Or the kitty one, litter, gross. Well, kitty litter. That's yeah. gross. <laughs> Keeping the dogs away from the kitty litter is a, we get that call quite a bit. And it's not, food issues are another, another thing. Um, I have it set up at my home where my dogs are not allowed in the, in the station where my cat's litter box is and where their food is so that they can't get in there and eat it. But I also have a situation where my older dog, my big dog, is on a special diet. 
Now, he is also a very slow eater and he's a very mellow dog. And when he'll eat slowly, but my two small dogs, my Jack Russell and my Chihuahua, will finish up their food and then push him away from his bowl and eat all of his. And to solve that situation, we set up